Um, I think I'll say a little bit about the play uh, to begin with. And there's, in a way, there's very little to say and there's much too much to say. It's, the plot is extremely simple. Um, Prometheus is being punished for stealing fire from the gods and giving it to humanity. Um, in the begin at the beginning of the play, uh, three henchmen of Zeus uh, perform this rather brutal execution. He's not only bound, but uh, a stake is driven through his chest. And he's immortal, so it's not killing him. And throughout the play, uh, he is visited by several characters who, um, well, they interact with him in each in a very different way. And they bring out of him um, an account of how he got into the position he's in. Um, his protest against the punishment, which he says is uh, completely unjust, in fact, outrageous. Uh, an accusation of Zeus being uh, a tyrant, a tyrant god, a, a god who um, who rules by whim and not by law. And he lets it be known to the people that he talks to and also implicitly to Zeus who is observing and hearing everything. You, you really get the sense during the play that everybody knows that Zeus is listening. And he lets Zeus know that he knows something that Zeus will need to learn from him uh, if he wants to escape a fate more terrible than that of Prometheus. And he says he will not release this knowledge until Zeus realizes that he's in very, very big trouble and comes running to Prometheus to receive that news. <laughs> so, before we begin, I'd, I'd like to ask you, Ron, because you got to know this character uh, very intimately over a long time that you practiced, that you, that you uh, rehearsed with it. So what is, your, what is your experience of Prometheus? Who is this character as you got to know him? Um, well, it was a process. Let me first say that um, <clears throat> we did a production of Prometheus Bound at the Getty Villa, um, which Norman is here, uh, my good friend who was working there at the time also. Uh, it's an, a small outdoor amphitheater in Malibu, connects with Malibu on the Pacific Coast Highway. So the sky was open for, for one. Um, so we had this big, beautiful outdoor amphitheater with the sky open and you could, it's so close to the water, you could smell the ocean uh, from the villa. And at night you could feel the, the ocean breeze coming in. You could actually see the stars and the birds. Um, so that, that's just to give you an example of the setup. The next thing was that the director, Travis Preston, in the Getty Villa got a company called Fly, F Fly by Foy? Do you remember, was it Norman? Fly, yes. Fly by Foy, which they do all these wonderful crane type fly things for big Broadway shows and uh, they work with Cirque du Soleil. They built a 24 foot steel wheel and inside the 24 foot steel wheel was another wheel that rotated within inside the larger wheel. Then the director placed Prometheus in the inside wheel in a crucifix position. So the whole play takes place with me on this 24 foot wheel in a crucifix position, doing the lines from there, looking down at the audience. So it kind of looked kind of like this. So the whole play is him talking like this and looking down and, and coming in, but he couldn't put his arms down and his feet could dangle, so it actually looked. So that was the beginning of the conversation about Prometheus. And the first thing that came to our mind was, of course, Jesus Christ and the crucifixion and Jesus' story of how he was giving to man and was crucified by all those who didn't believe uh, in God, in the one God. So our conversation started from there and how to build this character because that was the first 
identifiable thing that just seemed pretty obvious. Uh, but then as the conversation went on, we started to see that um, he represented um, this heroic revolutionary figure who could be anyone who is railing against the establishment. So, so many different um, characters in American history and European history and African history came up. Uh, any one man or woman that people would follow because um, of either a, the system or we talked about fascism, we talked about um, uh, socialism and all these different ideas that set humans up to be more powerful than everyone else, whether it be one human being or a system or a group of people. Um, and then we discussed Prometheus as an enlightener or a person that gives light, education, a knowledge of the arts, um, um, also the sun and fire, meaning the, the, the most important thing. Fire brings light, light brings knowledge, and so we actually went all the way back and tried to come up through time and all the examples that came up in regards to what light brings. What, what does light perceive to you? When you close your eyes and you open your eyes, what, what does the light do? Um, and how is it sustainable and how does it give life? So Prometheus became a figure that gave life to humans and made them raise their consciousness. Um, so these are some of the things that I started to develop um, the ideas for Prometheus um, and then working within the context of the story, um, mythical and at times very real. Um, some of the passages that you read in Prometheus seem so real today when we look at the political climate and, and different um, um, oh God, I, I can't find the word at the moment, but um, figures that, that, uh, that conquer and subjugate. Um, and that's the role that Zeus can you know, I, I think this is a, a perfect place to just read together the opening scene because I think that exemplifies how contemporary perfect. this play is. This is the scene just as... Uh, they're bringing Prometheus in to about to put him onto the wheel. Um, and Kratos and Hephaestus, who is a, re a relative of Prometheus, uh, Kratos is asking Hephaestus to take his, is it his cousin or he's somehow related they're to Prometheus. Rel they're relatives. They're relatives, relatives and friends. And right. they, they also and used to be. And he has to put Prometheus on and nail him to the cross. So Kratos, the name Kratos means might. So he's sort of the right, you know, there are two, there are three characters on the stage, Kratos, Bia, and Hephaestus, four. The fourth one is Prometheus, who is silent throughout. Another silent figure is Bia. She's the sister of Kratos. Bia is, means violence. So power or might and violence are the right and left hand of Zeus. They're not really characters, they're principles. And uh, Bia's silence is very logical because the violence is being executed in action on the stage. She's just there as a presence. So I begin, I will be Kratos. Please uh, cut me some slack, I'm not an actor. Uh, you too, Ron. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'll put on my uh, Kratos persona a little bit. We have arrived at the far limit of the world. These are the Scythian mountains, desolate and vast. Hephaestus, you must carry out the Father's will and bind the criminal to this steep, looming rock with chains of adamant, unbreakable. It was your flower he stole, the bright and dancing fire, and gave its wonder-working power to mortals. This is the crime for which he now must pay the price to all the gods, that he may learn to love the tyranny of Zeus and quit his friendship with the human race. Kratos and Bias, through your father's edict was perfectly fulfilled. Your task is done. But I don't have the courage to chain a god. 
who is my kin by force to this storm-swept ravine and yet necessity compels me to it's dangerous to slight the father's word high vision son of themis of wise counsel not of my own will but compelled by the same power that holds you captive i'm going to forge you to this barren cliff alone far from all human company with metal bonds impossible to break no mortal voice or form will bring you solace scorched by the sun your skin will wilt and wither you will be glad when night descends draping her gaudy cloak around the day and glad when dawn dispels the morning frost thus at all times one torment or another will plague you your rescuer is not yet born this is the fruit of your philanthropy a god you scorn the anger of the gods by granting mortals honor above their due for that you will keep virgil on this rock upright unsleeping and never bend a knee and many a groan will pass your lips and sighing and cries of bitter sorrow all in vain for zeus's vengeance is implacable everyone is harsh when new to power why hold back now what's all this foolish pity why don't you hate the god's worst enemy the one who gave your treasure to those day flies kinship holds fearsome power so does good fellowship yes but to disregard the father's words how can that be do you not fear that more how pitiless you are and insolent what good is there in shedding tears for him you're fretting uselessly on his behalf my skill my handicraft i hate you why hate it you may rest assured your skill is not to blame for this one's suffering i wish my skill were someone else's lot there are no carefree gods except for zeus he rules us all so he alone is free i recognize that now i see it clearly then hurry up and throw the chains around him before the father sees you wasting time i have the harness ready as you see encase his arms in it then pound your hammer against those nails and pin him to the rock the work is getting done you needn't worry now drive those nails in deeper leave no slack he's monstrously ingenious at escape he'll sooner move the mountain than move his arm then bind the other arm to let him know his cleverness can't match the mind of zeus no one can justly blame me except for him now drive that wedge right through his chest and let its bite reach deep into the rock oh pitiful prometheus forgive me <coughs> more pity for the enemy of zeus take care you don't bewail yourself someday you see a sight you see a sight no eye should have to see i see a villain getting his desserts now clap that iron hoop around his waist i'm forced to do this you don't have to press me i'll press you and i'll goad you if i must get down and manacle his knees and thighs the job is done it didn't take me long now pin his shackles tight with all your strength a stern taskmaster will assess our work your tongue repeats the language of your face be soft if that's your way but don't begrudge me my iron will and furious disposition his legs and arms are tightly bound let's leave and now kratos turns to prometheus go play the rebel now go plunder the god's treasure and give it to your creatures of a day what portion of your pain can mortals spare you the gods who named you the forethinker were mistaken you'll need forethought beyond your reckoning to wriggle your way out of this device and now kratos bia and hephaestus leave the stage and uh, prometheus is left alone would you like to move to the podium ron um yeah sure <laughs> hello uh, uh, uh. 
So Prometheus is alone on the stage, and now this is the first time he speaks. O sky, O soaring winds and brightness of the air, O river springs and countless laughter of the ocean's waves, O Mother Earth, O sun, all-seeing, brilliant eye, I call you all to witness. See what I, a god, must suffer at the hands of gods. Witness to torture and disgrace I must endure through endless time, miseries designed for me by the new monarch of the blessed. What end is there? I say this yet, I knew it all before. All that shall be foreseen and clearly known, what hidden hurt could take me by surprise? I'll bear as lightly as I can what fate decreed for me. I know full well no power can stand against necessity. And yet, I can't accept my lot, neither in silence nor in speech, that I was yoked in chains for bringing gifts to mortal men. I hunted out and stole the secret spring of fire and hid it in a fennel stalk to teach them every art and skill with endless benefit. For this offense, I now must pay the penalty to live nailed to this rock beneath the open sky. What is that? Where? This murmuring, this subtle scent. Near, though I cannot see it, is it a god? Is it a mortal, or god and mortal both at once? Who comes to the world's edge to view my suffering? Or to what purpose? See the ill-fated god in chains, the enemy of Zeus, a vile affront to all who walk the halls of Zeus, punished for his excessive love of man. What's this? Close by again, this wiring in the air like wings of a gigantic bird approaching. Whatever it is, I fear it! Now here, um He's clearly fearing uh, the famous eagle who will tear at his liver. But that time is very far away. And uh, who arrives instead are the daughters of Ocean, the daughters of the god of Ocean. Well, the god's name is Ocean, Okeanos. And he's the god of the, uh, <coughs> the oceanic river that surrounds the earth. They arrive in a chariot uh, that is uh, that has wings on it, so it's a, it's a winged chariot on which they come. At first, the uh, the chorus is actually unaware of the plight that Prometheus is in. They've heard the clanging of steel in their cavern by the sea and just came quickly out of curiosity to see what's going on. And their first uh, statement to Prometheus is an apology for showing up barefoot. They said it's, they went in such a hurry that they weren't properly clad. And then they see uh, the condition he is in and are uh, horrified. And uh, all of this is expressed in, in the form of a, an ode. It's, a, it's beautiful uh, poetic speech, which is uh, pronounced in chorus by these young girls. Prometheus is uh, very happy at their arrival and immediately uh, begins lamenting. He, he feels their, their sympathy and uh, simply starts saying, I, I, wish that, uh, I wish that Zeus had banished me beneath the earth. Here I'm suspended for all my enemies to come and gloat on me. But as he speaks, uh, his anger, his uh, resistance to Zeus, his accusation that Zeus is uh, an unjust god frightens the chorus, and they are as frightened by his, uh, by his speech as they are by what Zeus has done to him. Finally, uh, Prometheus says, don't worry, there will, there'll come a time when Prometheus will come to me and ask for my friendship. He says, his heart will soften, his rage will finally relent, he will be eager for my friendship, and I, I will await him eagerly. Then the chorus says, reveal it all to us, tell us the story, 
For what iniquity did Zeus arrest you and punish you with torture and disgrace? Tell us, unless telling adds to your pain. Now Prometheus. I'm sorry, I lost my page, Joe. Do you remember the... <laughs> I, I'm reading from a different text. Uh, I'll tell you in a second. To talk about this. To talk about this. Mm -hmm. Great. To talk about these things is painful, but silence too is painful. There's no escape from misery either way. When anger first sprang up amongst the gods and quickly whirled them into strife, some wanting Zeus to seize the throne of Kronos while others rose in fury against such rule, I offered advice to the Titans, the children of heaven and earth, but was unable to persuade them. For they, proud of their strength and arrogant, despised my ploy, believing they would win with little effort and by force alone. So oh, let, me, let me interrupt you, because this, this is contrary to our plan. <laughs> I asked you to read something that wasn't, uh, it'll take up more time than we have. Okay, fine. So I'll sum up what the speech is. He's, he begins a long speech uh, telling uh, the chorus about um, how he got into this trouble. The story, in short, is that when there was a great war between uh, the Titans and the gods, Prometheus is a Titan, Prometheus had received uh, knowledge from his mother, the earth goddess uh, Themis, or Gaia, that in this war, uh, the winner would win by guile and not by might. She didn't predict who would win, but she said that would be what wins the battle. When he advised uh, the Titans of this, they paid it no attention, they weren't interested. And he, knowing then that they were doomed, uh, offered his skill, his knowledge, his intelligence to Zeus, who accepted the offer. So Prometheus and Themis became allies of Zeus, the Titans were destroyed. They were thrown into the deepest place in the cosmos, Tartarus. Um, and Prometheus became Zeus's right-hand man and uh, became kind of his administrator. He organized, he, he apportioned different powers to all the different gods and uh, helped him to create his tyranny. Zeus had a plan to destroy humanity. They were basically a useless lot. They had, there was no culture, no civilization, and they were kind of miserable. Uh, they weren't really, uh, had, they didn't have the intelligence of animals. They were just kind of lost creatures who lived long lives in a miserable way, and it was just a big mistake, and he wanted to get rid of them. Prometheus pitied humanity, and uh, brought them fire and and this he tells later uh, with fire he brought them all the arts of civilization and for this he is being punished the chorus knowing at this point only that he brought them fire um, question that a little bit and they say did you perhaps go further than you told us and he says well I gave men power to stop foreseeing their death. What cure did you prescribe for this disease? I sowed blind hopes to live as their companions. <laughs> Truly you brought great benefit to mortals. I gave them fire. Bright fire. Do the ephemerals have it now? And from it they will learn much craft and skill. So, Uh, Prometheus then, uh, they criticize Prometheus for his stubborn opposition to Zeus, and then he says, well, it's very easy to, you know, criticize somebody who is in a state of disaster. You're standing outside the circle of disaster, uh, but I have known this all along. So then he says, please, settle down, come near me, and I'll tell you the story. And they 
settle down by his feet and are willing to hear him. And at this point, a new character arrives, and this is Ocean, Okeanos. He arrives on a winged horse. So I will be Okeanos for the beginning of this. And he says, I've traveled far to find you, Prometheus, and come to the end of my journey, guiding my swift-winged bird by the power of my thought, without reins, compelled by blood ties and feeling your fate. But even kinship aside, in my heart, no one dwells higher than you. Know this, for flattery is not in my nature. So tell me how I can help you, and you will never speak of a friend more faithful than Okeanos. Well now, what's this? Have you two come to watch me suffering? How did you summon the courage and why to leave the stream that bears your name and your rock-roofed cave that built itself and come here to this motherland of iron? Was it to talk about my torment? Was it to share the taste of my anger? Look at me then, and view the display. Witness the friend of Zeus, who helped create the tyrant's rule, twisted in agony by his command. So, Prometheus does not trust this man at all. Uh, he recognizes the sincerity of his wish to help, but there's something in the way Okeanos uh, speaks, if you read some of his lines, a little carefully, it seems that Okeanos is being sent by Zeus to tell Prometheus, just stop talking, just be quiet, and I can make an arrangement with Zeus. And, uh, and he speaks in the, ter in the terms of, uh, you know, very good and sound conventional wisdom. He says, you know, know yourself, recognize the situation you're in, uh, make necessary accommodations and just you know you're very very wise you're very very uh, skillful but in some way you're really being stupid um, and uh, Prometheus is simply not available for this and uh, Okeanos tries very hard and I think sincerely to, to persuade him. And finally, uh, Prometheus, uh, finally, Okeanos says, uh, you know, I give up. He says, your fate, Prometheus, is my teacher here. And Prometheus says, well, then leave. Go home and keep that understanding. And Okeanos says, I'm on my way already, as you say that. The four-legged bird is fanning with his wings the boundless track of air. He will be glad to bend his knee in his home stable, which is a little bit of a cruel last word to Prometheus who can't bend his knee, like one of the stress positions, to use modern terms, that he was put in was that he can't, he can't bend his knee for roughly 30,000 years. So, Okeanos exits and then the chorus uh, is a very uh, beautiful ode of lamentation, um, which I will not read because it'll take too long. But it's, um, they, they describe how the lament for the suffering of Prometheus is actually cosmic. The whole earth wails aloud in lamentation weeps and groans, mourning the ancient majesty that was the kingdom you and your brothers ruled. And then finally, in the final part of the ode, they say, the ocean's wave, once risen, falls with a groan of sorrow. The depths call out their endless grief. Hades' dark kingdom weeps unheard below. The springs of sacred flowing streams lament your terrible suffering without cease. You know, Prometheus. Um, where, I, <laughs> you jumped, you skipped on me. I did? Yeah, um, were you at... Uh, Don't think that I am silent out of pride. Okay. Uh, 
uh, it should be page 28. Thank you. Don't think that I am silent out of vanity or stubbornness. My backward turning thoughts eat at my heart on seeing myself discarded in this way. And yet who else but I marked out of these new gods their bounds and privileges. But I won't speak of this. You know it. Listen instead to what I have to tell of human misery. How I gave shrewdness to their childish minds and taught them how to reason. It's no reproach to humans when I say this, but to set forth the friendly purpose of my gifts. In the beginning they could see, but seeing was useless to them. And hearing, they heard nothing. Like dreams with shifting shapes, their long lives ran their course in meaningless confusion. They had no knowledge of brick houses built to face the sun. They knew no carpentry. They dwelled beneath the ground like swarming ants in dismal caves. They could not tell with certainty the approach of winter or the flowery spring or summer with its fruits. Their every act was without purpose until I showed them the rising and the setting of the stars. Not easy to discern. And numbers too. The supplice science I invented for them and the joining of letters, which is the very memory of things, and the fucan mother to the muse's arts. I was the first to bring wild beasts under the yoke, slaves to relieve mortals of the work that was too hard for their weak bodies. I taught the horse obedience to the reins, and harnessed him, the very emblem of a rich man's pride to the swift running chariot, and who but I made for the mariner his cloth-winged sea-traversing vehicle. Such skills and such devices did I give to mortals with diligence and care. But I have no device to free myself from this disaster. Disgrace and suffering have warped your judgment. You are confused. Like a bad doctor who has fallen ill, you cannot find the potion that would heal you. You will be more astonished when you hear the rest from me. How many arts and skillful means I invented, the greatest of them is this. If anyone fell ill, there was no remedy, no healing food or drink, no salve, no potion. For lack of medicine, they wasted. Until I showed them how to mix soothing elixirs that can steer the course of any sickness, the various forms of prophecy, I laid them out and made a system of them. And it was I who first distinguished among dreams those that would come to pass and who's divined for humans the secret sense of calls and broken words and chance encounters on a journey. I taught them how to read the flights of the crook talon birds for signs auspicious and of evil portent and mark their different ways, each kind distinct for what they feed on, their mutual hatreds and affections, their rituals of assembly, also the smoothness of entrails, the necessary color of the gall to please the gods, as well as the mod modeled symmetry of the liver's lobe. And for the sacrifice, I burned a thigh bone and a chine concealed in fat to teach the fine art, difficult to learn, of enticing the gods. I cleared man's vision to discern the flashing signs in fire which were unknown before. All that was hidden I made plain, the treasures concealed beneath the earth, bronze, iron, silver, gold. Who can lay claim to their discovery but I? No one, I'm sure, except to make an empty boast. I'll sum it up for you in one short word. All human arts were founded by Prometheus. So, uh, shortly after this, a very uh, strange and wonderful character appears. And this is Eel. Uh, you may remember or have heard of this, the myth of Eel. A, a young girl who was courted by Zeus, um, and his uh, courtship was noticed by Zeus's wife, Hera, who became extremely jealous, and Zeus 
uh, fearing for his relationship with Hera and also for the loss of the relationship with uh, with Eo, transformed Eo into a, a heifer, a white cow. Uh, Hera uh, saw through this uh, disguise and in her jealousy uh, sent uh, a gadfly to torment this cow and start chasing it across the world and for good measure she appointed a cowherd who was uh, endowed with a thousand eyes I suppose his whole body was covered with eyes to be her guardian and so this poor uh, mad uh, girl uh, the way it appears in the play is that she's really, she's just mad. She thinks she's a cow. And she appears like a cow. I don't know how this is actually performed uh, regularly. But, um, so she's, uh, she's being t chased around and she appears on the scene in this very uh, remote corner of the earth where Prometheus is crucified and sees him and after just simply lamenting helplessly about her condition and appealing to Zeus, who is really the cause of all her problems, says, what did I do? Why did you do this to me? Uh, she sees Prometheus and asks him who he is. And he tells her, he says, I am Prometheus. And a dialogue develops that is, uh, I find, really extraordinary because she's human. Uh, Prometheus is a god. She's mortal. He's immortal. The difference in rank is unimaginably great. And yet they speak to each other as equals. Uh, Prometheus uh, sympathizes with her because she's, she's the same as he is. She's a victim of Zeus. And in that recognition, uh, Eo kind of comes out of her trance. She sort of becomes sane and can have a, a, a really realistic conversation. And she turns out to be extremely brave. She wants to know what her future is because Prometheus has the gift of foresight. He begins to tell her and then he says, no, you know, it won't be good for you. Uh, it's better that you don't know. She insists. And the chorus is also, and the chorus is eager for her story. So between her and the chorus, Zeus says, okay, since you absolutely insist, I'll tell you. So he begins to describe her future travails. I know they're extreme adventures and uh, very terrifying experiences that she will have. At some point, she wants to throw herself off the cliff and she wants to end her life. And he says, well, you have it better than me. I can't die. Um, and he lets slip something that actually uh, restores courage in her. He says, I will be in this situation until Zeus is deposed. When Zeus loses his power, then I can get out of this. And she says, Zeus deposed? How can that be? And he says, well, it'll happen. At this point, his earlier prediction that Zeus will come to him running as a friend is beginning to reverse itself, and he's predicting Zeus's destruction. Um, his prophecies to her continue. At some point, she arrives in Egypt, and then, strangely, Zeus appears to her, and instead of raping her, as one would expect, he places a kind of blessing hand on her, and she becomes pregnant and gives birth to a son, a black son, who becomes uh, the king of Egypt and is the progenitor of uh, descendants which in the 13th generation will give birth to the man, the hero, who will save Prometheus. So that's the, the long story that he tells her. And at that point she falls back into madness and runs off the stage uh, just screaming because the beautiful end is so far away but her appointed role right now is to be mad and driven and that's what she so does. Did you mention who that child? Yes, it's Heracles or Hercules, Hercules. yes. Uh, and the very strange details in it is that Zeus thereby becomes uh, 
the forefather of Hercules through, through uh, Eel, but also the, the woman who eventually gives birth to Hercules is a woman, uh, Zeus is the father of that birth. So Zeus is twice the cause of, of the savior of, um, of Prometheus. So after Eo leaves, uh, at this point, uh, Prometheus has become incredibly belligerent towards Zeus. And uh, promptly, a new character appears. And that is Hermes. This is Hermes is the messenger of Zeus. And Hermes arrives, and he has all the character of an interrogator. He's being sent to get the secret. Who is this woman with whom Zeus will have a child, a son, who will be the destroyer, who will be stronger than the father, and who will just smash Zeus and put him into a situation worse than Prometheus. Who is this woman? I want to know her identity. But look, here comes his lackey, a carrier pigeon of our new commander-in-chief. No doubt he comes with some important news. Supreme conniver, master of complaints, fire thief who mocks the gods and idolizes dayflies. The father wants to know, what is this marriage which you boast will cause his downfall? Speak your truth plainly, without riddling subterfuge, and do not make me take this voyage twice, Prometheus. These, he points to the chains, these should be proof enough that Zeus does not take kindly to your tricks. Pompously spoken as befits a mouthpiece of the gods. You're young, the lot of you, and young in power, and think your fortress is secure from sorrow, but I've already seen two tyrants fall, and see the third, our present ruler, falling soon, more suddenly and much more shamefully than they or do you think I'll cringe before this upstart gods and tremble? I'm farther from that than you can imagine. So scurry back away, you came. You will receive no answer to your question. This is the arrogance that brought you here. Let me assure you, I would not exchange my own misfortune for your slavery. I'm sure it's preferable to be this bolder slave than Father Zeus's trusted messenger. A tyrant's trust dishonors those who earn it. What honor is there in your insolence? It spits contempt at insolence itself. I think you rather relish your condition. Relish? I wish my enemies could relish this and count you among them. You're blaming me for your misfortune? I'll say it plainly. I detest you all for repaying right with wrong and good with evil. You've clearly lost your mind. This is a sickness. I'm sick if hating those who harm one is a sickness. You'd be unbearable if you were free. Oh, misery. That's an expression Zeus has never learned. As time grows old, it teaches everything. But you have yet to learn some common sense. How true. I wouldn't talk with servants if I had it. It seems you will not answer Zeus's question. Am I indebted to him for his kindness? You're mocking me as if I were a child. And are you not a child, and even simpler than a child, to think that I would tell you anything? No torture, promise, or device will ever move me to tell Zeus the things I know until he sets me free from this outrageous bondage. So let him throw his firebolts. Let him terrify the world with the white wings of blizzards and the growl and roar of earthquakes. I won't bend. I certainly won't tell him whose hands he'll be removed from his supremacy. What is your profit in this? Think about it. This was determined a long time ago. Think better of it, fool. Take stock of who you are and where your fate has brought you. Your words have no effect on me. You might as well try to persuade a wave out of its course. Don't think that I, for fear of Zeus's whims, will ever, like a beggar, raise my upturned hands imploring him to set me free. I do not have it in me. So, I'm reading from my introduction here because that'll tell the, this. Uh, intervening thing 
uh, simply. Finally, Hermes displays the full arsenal of threats at his disposal. He describes the threefold tidal wave of misery Prometheus will suffer if he does not comply. A cataclysmic plunge into Tartarus, still chained to his rock but encased within it. A return to the world of light after an enormous span of time. And finally, exposure to Zeus's wing winged hound, a scarlet eagle that will feast day by day on his continually regenerating liver. Uh, these horrors can be avoided, he says, if Prometheus will just give up his stubbornness, weigh his options, and make the only reasonable uh, choice. Of all his arguments, this is the most insidious because the most reasonable. Any character in a Greek drama depicting a justly ordered world would be well advised to take Hermes' suggestion to heart. That is why the chorus, terrified for their friend, implore him, heed his words, it's shameful for the wise to dwell in, in error. But the world of this play is a tyranny. Uh, conventional wisdom has lost its bearings. Prometheus' response to the chorus reflects the true state of affairs. This message, uh, the, the message this proclaimer barks at me was known to me before, but for an enemy to suffer at an enemy's hand is natural and no disgrace. So um, then uh, Hermes says, okay, he says to the chorus, you, you are about to, uh, to step into a, a terrible disaster, get out of the way because it's coming and you will have only yourself to blame. Don't say that Zeus did this to you. You are willingly, knowingly stepping into this. And then the chorus does something you know, amazing. It's like this uh, great uh, turning point in the play. Uh, the chorus says, speak to me in a different voice or give me counsel I can follow. None of what you say is bearable. How can you ask such wickedness of me? I want to suffer with him what he suffers, for I have learned to despise traitors. There is no plague more worthy of being spat on. And at this point, Hermes says, well, I have nothing, no more business here, and he uh, leaves, leaves the stage. Um, Prometheus. <laughs> The earth is shaking now, <clears throat> in truth, no longer in words. A hollow roar of thunder rolls up from the depths. Great winds, winding coils of light short for shoot forth with heat and hissing. Squalls swirl up like dust clouds. Now all the winds are at each other's throats. The sea is mingled with the sky, and here it comes. In plain view, the onslaught sent by Zeus for my own terror. O oh, holy mother earth, O oh, sky whose light revolves for all. You see me, you see the wrongs I suffer. Ron, did we read the one which, where he says the message this proclaimer barks at me? Did we read that one? Uh, no, we didn't, actually. So before, what, what Ron just read was like the absolute final end, but uh, when the chorus says, it's shameful for the wise to dwell in error, Prometheus shifts to a prophetic voice, and he begins to foresee, in a way he's like stealing Zeus's fire. He already knows what Zeus is going to do to him, and he begins describing it. So, Ron, if you would read that speech quickly. Okay, I can't find, like, give me a page, uh, do you have Ooh. a page? No. 55. That's Hermes. So we didn't uh, have that in pencil, Joel, so I, oh, thank you. The book, the message this proclaimer barks at me was known to me before. But for an enemy to suffer at an enemy's hand is natural and no disgrace. 
So let the doubly twisted braid of fire strike my head. Let savage winds and thunder convulse the world and chafe the bowels of earth into a frenzy. Let the storm lash the ocean's waves till they confound the courses of the stars. And let the vortex of inescapable necessity conduct my body to the eternal night of Tartarus. He cannot kill me. So it's here that Hermes says, such words and thoughts are signs of madness. How do these wild boasts differ from the ravings of a lunatic? But you who weep on his behalf, hurry and leave this place. Go far away and quickly before the unforgiving roar of thunder stuns your senses. It's at that point that the chorus rebels and then Hermes leaves and then come the final words of, of Prometheus, which you already read, where he, he describes the cataclysm that's gonna swallow him up. That's it. <laughs> We ran a little over here. Hey, thank you, uh, this time we have time for maybe one or two questions from the audience, if anyone has anything to ask to Joel or Ron. Right here. It's fantastic. Thank you so, so much. Vocabulary is exquisite, so finely tuned. So when he stole the fire, did that mean that Zeus didn't have it anymore? Or Zeus didn't just want it, he wanted us not to have it. He wanted us not to have it, because okay. to steal fire, so you just need a little this. bit. <laughs> I have no idea what a fennel stalk has to do with it, but. <laughs> That's what he hit the fire. Yes, but why? Why a fennel stalk? There must be some symbolism. Apparently, this is something that uh, People in a certain part of uh, Crete, I think, still do. They still transport fire in a fennel stalk. Fantastic. I don't know how it's done, but that's how they, they, they carry yeah. it around that way. So, <laughs> did he love us? We don't hear this word in the Greek plays, love. Mm. But what, what great force. Mm. Well, he it, knew he would pay the price. He yes, he did. He, he says knew it. everything. He says, I transgressed willingly. I knew that this was going to happen. Is this I did about it anyway. human fellowship? What we can yeah, give to it? So. I think it's so. A it's huge about solidarity among human beings. And goodness. Mm. And giving. Mm. <laughs> what a concept. Mm. <laughs> this will be our last question for the night. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to ask you how you understand Prometheus as a character. Um, there was no follower. He defied God, and unlike Jesus Christ. And uh, nobody, no figure in later history ever copied him or identified with him. Mm -hmm. In that sense, he never left legacy of his character. Mm. What do you think about it? Well, I think in terms of religion, uh, Christianity created a new idea of God. The Christian God is a God that loves humanity and, you know, in other words, uh, God is endowed with benevolent intentions in Christianity which this uh, Zeus in this play uh, completely lacks. He's completely hard. However, uh, the, this was one of three plays. It was a trilogy. Mm -hmm. And the other two plays are lost. And it's almost certain that Zeus changes, that by the end of the story, in, in, the, in the trilogy, uh, Zeus is not the character that we see in the first play. So what you say, there would be make no sense to defy God anymore? Because wouldn't, God it, it wouldn't be necessary. Prometheus is in the end released. There are signs, you know, little fragments that are left of the... Mm -hmm. Prometheus is released in the end and uh, is actually restored to very high honor in exchange for some kind of a metal thing that he puts on his head or his arm, I forget which, that 
is an acknowledgement that Zeus is God, that Zeus is, is the top God, and that he is subject to Zeus. He accepts that, but he is given honors. And when one has to assume that Zeus uh, becomes a, a just God, because that was the Athenian conception of him. Mm -hmm. right, thank you. I, say, I think Joel does a wonderful job in this introduction. Uh, Joel does a wonderful job in the introduction to this volume of talking about uh, the kind of historical heirs of Prometheus all the way down into the 20th century, yes. um, which I think is a great uh, contribution mm -hmm. to the literature. One of the reasons that uh, the Getty asked for this translation was that, well, there were two things, um, but the first, most importantly, was that there wasn't a good translation for American actors. Uh, the, a lot of the better translations in English that are out there were quite British in their approach and their inflection. And uh, I hope, I hope that this will turn out to be a very widely produced translation mm -hmm. because it was written specifically for the stage mm -hmm. uh, and for Americans. Mm -hmm. And um, the, uh, it, it's worth noting that in that uh, California production, there was an original musical score which drew very heavily on the jazz tradition. Mm -hmm. um, it was... Um, it was commissioned after Ron was cast, and so um, the feeling of the entire production was very American yes. in, in its sound. Yes. Okay, well that's just about um, all that we have time for tonight. Uh, on behalf of The Strand, thank you so much to Ron and Joel for being here.